Hello and thank you for joining us for our midweek Bible study for June 9th, 2020. Glad that you could join us. We are in the middle of a study on the names of God uh, as found in the Old Testament. And uh, tonight we want to continue with that. And just a reminder, we're using uh, the book by Ken Hempfield, The Names of God, as a, a reference, kind of a guide as we go through these names of God. Tonight, the name that we're going to be looking at is Jehovah Sidkenu. Uh, the Lord is our righteousness. And we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, as our focal verse tonight. And uh, once again, as in many of the previous names of God that we have studied, it's helpful, uh, if not necessary, to see the introduction of this name of God in the context in which it is given. So uh, to do that, we're going to look in the book of Jeremiah chapter 23. And I want us to start in verse 1, actually. And uh, take a look and see what the Lord has given us here. This is Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. He says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor ter be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can be encouraged, that we can be challenged. Lord, that we can be informed as to our faith encouraged as we learn more about the great God whom we serve. And Father, we just thank you for the time that we have to be able to spend in your word tonight. Uh, open our eyes and the hearts of our understanding to be able to receive your word with joy and with gladness. And Father, to ask uh, what truth do we need to learn tonight? What truth do you have for us as individuals that we can take to heart and that we can grow from. And then, Father, as a congregation, a body of believers here at Liberty Baptist Church, I pray that you would help us to see how we can grow in the truths that we're learning about you. Thank you for your word. Would you bless our time in your word tonight? Uh, we just give you praise with thanksgiving. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, to organize the information that we've got on uh, Jehovah Sidkenu, I think it's helpful for us to use an outline to guide our study. So tonight our outline, outline goes something like this. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 23 of Jeremiah, we're going to look at the fact that the, bads, the bad shepherds scatter. Uh, and uh, secondly, we're going to look at the God shepherd gathers. And then we're going to th look thirdly at the God shepherd brings new leader. The God shepherd brings a new leader. So first we want to look at the bad shepherds scatter, and we see this in verses 1 and 2. Now the time period, uh, just to give the setting for this account, what all is taking place is right before the king of Babylon overthrows Jerusalem. Now God, through Jeremiah, had been pronouncing judgment on the people, and this judgment is to two groupings of people that we have addressed in this passage. And the first is, is to the sheep. Uh, to the sheep, the people in general, and God pronounces judgment on them for their moral rottenness, their ongoing rebellion against God, their failure to live up to the standard that God had called them to do. And this was seen in their dealings with, with one another, and they're, they're cheating, they're lying, uh, the, they're abusing of one another, and, and then their faithlessness to God, particularly in the area of idolatry. They were worshiping the false gods of those around them who were not even uh, real gods to begin with. Uh, so, and, and that's expressed, we can see, you can look in Jeremiah 10 through 12, where God lays out the case uh, about their idolatry in there. So you've got the sheep that, that God is addressing, and he, and he has uh, rebuked them, and he has warned them, and now he's pronouncing judgment on them. But secondly, I want us to see a second group, and that group is the shepherds. 
the shepherds. And within the shepherds, there are two subgroups that I want us to be able to identify. And the first of these are the religious shepherds, the religious shepherds. We're talking about the prophets and we're talking about the priests. So uh, aside from our focal scriptures, we can read God's scathing rebuke of the prophets and the priests in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 9 through 40. So if you continue on in this same chapter, you will see where God lays out his uh, indictment to them. And so he gets on to the religious shepherds. And we saw even in the passage uh, that we're dealing with here, the fact that they were not tending their, the, uh, the flock, they were scattering them. And we're going to dig into that in just a little bit uh, more detail in just a few moments. But you had the religious shepherds, the prophets and the priests, and then you had the civil shepherds. You had the kings, the civil, civic leaders of that time. The last king who had been identified as having done right in the sight of the Lord was King Josiah. But since his death, there'd been a steady succession of kings. Um, there was Jehoahaz, who served a whopping three months uh, before he was deposed. There is Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoiakim, rather, excuse me, who was carried off by king, the king of Babylon after 11 years. And then there was Jehoiakim, who did evil in the sight of the Lord and uh, was probably 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned a whopping three months, 10 days. And uh, then Babylon removed him and set into place this fourth king, whose name uh, would become to known as Zedekiah. So there'd been a steady uh, line of kings who had been on the throne of Judah in these final days, and each one had become uh, as bad, if not worse, than the one before him. So God has an indictment of the shepherds that we can read in chapter 23. Listen to these phrases to describe uh, what God is saying. He says, you're destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. He says that in verse 1. You're destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. Uh, instead of taking care of them, of providing pre protection for them, of making sure that they had the nourishment that they needed, that you were doing the responsibilities of a shepherd, instead you were acting against them, destroying them, scattering them, causing them to wander away from the Lord. We see the spiritual imagery uh, in, in this um, rebuke that the Lord gives. And he goes on, he says, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. You've failed in your responsibilities. A shepherd was to look after the sheep, to watch for their safety, to, to make sure that their needs were being met, to watch out for predators. But these spiritual leaders were not doing that. They were failing in that responsibility, both, both the spiritual leaders as far as the priests and the prophets, but also the civil leaders, the kings, the other leaders of that time were not watching out for the people. Instead, they were leading them down a downward trend. The shepherds, or rather God's judgment here, he says, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds. He said, you may not be attending to the needs of my people, but I want you to know something. I am going to attend to you and make sure that you are held responsible for not fulfilling your responsibilities. Well, the shepherds had abandoned their responsibility to look after the sheep. The prophets and the priests had failed to honor God before the people. They prophesied falsely. They failed to address the sins of the people. And that's important. You can't just always be patting someone on the back, but you need to also be careful and be watchful for when they're falling into sin to warn them of the danger of that, to warn them of God's judgment, of his wrath even. So instead of, of addressing the sins of the people, instead they were prophesying a false peace. Everything's going to be okay. God's going to take care of us. While neglecting the fact that the people were caught up in sin, that they were rebelling, that they were caught up in idolatry, that they were serving themselves and not serving God. You know, is it any wonder that the nation was on a swift road to judgment. And then there were the kings. Instead of following in the footsteps of Josiah, they followed in the pattern of Manasseh, one of the most wicked kings of Judah. And instead of heeding God's warnings to repent, they led the nation down, a down a downward even faster than they had been. So in contrast, what I want you to see, in contrast to the unrighteous character and behavior of the sheep and their shepherds, I want you to see, secondly, the God shepherd. And the first thing we see about the God shepherd is that he gathers. Instead of scattering as the shepherds were doing to the sheep, 
the God Shepherd gathers. Verses 3 and 4 describe the intentions of the one who knows how to shepherd. And there's three promises that, that I see in these verses that are, are good for us to pick up. Uh, and the first is the promise to gather. The promise to gather. Ver, verse 3, he says, I will gather the remnant. God said, I will gather them. I will be the shepherd. I will go after them. I will gather them and I will bring them back. God said, I'm going to gather them. I'm going to bring them back to the pasture in which they're supposed to be. The God shepherd, God who is our shepherd, will not leave his sheep lost and wandering. He goes after them to get them wherever they are. So God promises to gather. Secondly, the God shepherd, as I'm using this title, gives us the promise of growing, the promise of growing. God says they will be fruitful and multiply. The sheep that are under my care, God says, they're going to be fruitful. They're going to multiply. They're no longer going to be anemic and uncared for. I'm going to see that my sheep are well provided for, the Lord says. And this is going to be evidenced in their growth and the fact that they're going to multiply. The fact that they're going to multiply. So God gives the promise of not only gathering his sheep, but seeing those sheep grow, tending to them as the shepherd should have been tending to them already. And then thirdly, I want you to see the promise of guarding. The promise of guarding. He says, I will also raise up shepherds over them. And then secondly, they will not be afraid any longer, nor terrified, nor be missing. These shepherds, God was going to put in place. And God was going to make sure that these were shepherds who loved his sheep and would take care of them. Look at the, look at the things that God says. He says, these sheep will not be afraid any longer. Why? Because they know they have a shepherd or an under-shepherd who cares for them, who's watching out for them, who's protecting them. It says they will not be terrified. They'll not be terrified. Listen, sheep get skittish. And when there is an enemy, when there is a predator around, they get even more skittish. And they can run off, they can wander off and find themselves in further danger. But God says, I'm going to put shepherds over them so that they will not be terrified. The sheep will know that the shepherd loves them. And then the final thing I think it's interesting to see. He says, not only will they no longer be afraid, they'll no longer be terrified, but none will be missing. Missing. There's going to be accountability. And the shepherds that are going to be placed over the flocks are going to make sure that each and every sheep is accounted for and each and every sheep is looked after and that's important it's you know what it's good to know that God takes thought for each and every one of his sheep not one of them will be missing not one of them will be terrified or afraid I'm going to guard my sheep and the shepherds that I put over my sheep they will guard my sheep you know, the Lord will provide shepherds who will act in accordance with His will. They're not going to act like we find in John 10, 12-13 when Jesus is talking. It says, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. God says, I'm going to put sheep over you that care about you, that are going to make sure that they work on gathering you, that are going to work on making sure you can grow. And they're going to be shepherds who guard you, guard you from the predators who are all around. But thirdly, I want you to see, or the uh, third point is that the God shepherd brings a new leader. The God shepherd brings a new leader. And we see this in verses 5 and 6. And here we're getting to the introduction of the name of God that we have for tonight. In case you thought I had forgotten it, we have not. We're just now getting to it. Uh, in, this, in verses 5 and 6, uh, what we have here is a section of messianic prophecy. Prophecy that's looking forward to the Lord Jesus who would uh, fulfill these things. And let me just reread it for you. He says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely 
and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. So listen to the things that God says that he will do. God says that he will raise up for David a righteous branch. Now the word branch can also be translated sprout. And the point is this, is that God is going to bless King David's house. And he's going to provide what was needed. He's going to provide the Messiah that was needed. Where things looked dead, God was going to bring forth the promise of new life. And in this particular case, a new leader, a new leader. You know, that prophetic title, the, the, the branch, is used uh, many times in the Old Testament. If we look in Isaiah 4, 2, or Isaiah 11, 1 through 5, uh, Isaiah 33, 15, those are places where um, the branch, the title for the Messiah is used. Also in the book of Zechariah, chapter 3, verse 8, uh, and in verse, uh, chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. So obviously, the prophet intends to refer to a key descendant of David who epitomizes all that the Lord, all that God has promised to David. And we know, being on this end of history, that that promised one was the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are three things that I want us to notice about the branch, okay? First of all, we want to look at his reign, the character of his reign. Uh, first, it says that he's going to reign as king and act wisely. Now, that's something that a few of the kings leading up to this time had actually done, Josiah being the last one who you could say in any way had acted uh, wisely and reigned well. Uh, secondly, it says that he will do justice and righteousness. That also is something that had not been seen in the nation of Judah for quite a long time. There had not been true justice. Uh, men did not treat other men fairly. They did not treat each other rightly. Uh, they were looking for ways to cheat one another, to defraud one another, to abuse one another. But when the branch comes, he will do justice and he will do righteousness. Thirdly, uh, secondly rather, not only his reign, the character of it, but I want you to see his results. What's going to happen when the branch reigns and rules as king? Well, we're going to experience, or the people will experience salvation and security. Salvation and security. The branch will be a good shepherd, or dare we say, the branch will be the good shepherd the good shepherd. Scripture says here in verse 6, it says that Judah, in his days, Judah will be saved. And it says, and Israel will dwell securely. Listen, when the Messiah comes, these things will take place. Judah will be saved. Now, their greatest salvation was not from some external enemy, but was from sin. They needed salvation from their sins. Israel will dwell securely. They will know God as their Savior. And when you know God as your Savior, you will dwell securely. So we've looked at his reign. We've, we've discussed or we've briefly looked at the results of his reign. But thirdly, I want you to see his renown. His renown. And this is where we get the name that we're looking at tonight. The name by which he will be called. And that name is the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah or Yahweh Sidkenu. Jehovah Sidkenu. So we finally do come to our next name of the Lord or God as we see in the scripture. Now Sidkenu or Sidek is translated 174 times with basically the same meaning and that is of being righteous. Now the word connotes conformity to an ethical or moral standard, um, which in the Old Testament would equate uh, to the nature and the will of God, someone who is aligning themselves with the law of God, with the word of God. What God had revealed to them was his law, what he said was to be. Um, consider 
the declaration of Scripture in Psalm 145, 17. It says, The Lord, and there again is the word Jehovah, is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. That characterization of God as righteous is important because God is the standard. And as the standard, he sets forth the standard for his people to obey. It is, it's the word of God. It's not what I think. It's not what you think. But it is what the word of God says is true. And we need to keep that in mind. We need to know that for certain. See, true righteousness is not so much in, with regard to current norms, but rather it's seen in conformity to the standard set forth in God's Word. Consider Moses' declaration to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 6.25. He said, It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all the commandment before the Lord our God. Once again, there's Jehovah, the covenant name of Israel's God. If we're careful to observe all this commandment before the Lord our God, just as he commanded us. God didn't just suggest it. He didn't say, you know what, this might be a good thing for you to do. No, he commanded it. And that means this is expected of you. This is the standard. You are to live by it. Moses said, it'll be righteousness for us if we're careful to observe these things. And in Psalm 1, we see the character of the righteous and the wicked contrasted. And the final statement of that psalm says that the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows the way of the righteous. He's intimately acquainted with the ways of the righteous. He takes note of it. But the way of the wicked will perish. There's one end for the, for the wicked, and, that, and that's perish. That's punishment. You know, as we peruse the Old Testament, we see that the children of Israel demonstrated their inability and their unwillingness to conform to God's law. It had been a steady spiral down. So because that was true, God, out of his infinite love, mercy, and grace, provides or provided the only way that they could be righteous. And that was by receiving the righteousness of Christ. Now, in the Old Testament, they had to look forward to that time. They needed to look forward to God's promise of the Messiah. For those of us in this day and age, we look back to the Messiah. We look back to what God did for us. Listen, neither you nor I have the ability to keep the entire Word of God, even if we desired to do so. Let, let that sink in. Neither you nor I have the ability to keep the entire Word of God, even if we desired to. Listen, Jesus Christ alone meets the perfect standard of God's righteousness. And God, who loves us so very much, has provided the way, the way, that we can have that righteousness, His righteousness, credited to us. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 5.21 puts it this way, and, and we've heard this a lot here recently here at Liberty. It says, He made Him, talking about God the Father, made Him the Son, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Listen, the Lord Jesus is the King who reigns and acts with wisdom. The Lord Jesus is the one through whom Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And he is the one, the Lord Jesus is the one through whom we can be made right with God. Because he is the Lord of righteousness. He is the Lord of our righteousness, Jehovah Sid Canoe. So I want to ask you a question tonight as we bring this time to a conclusion. Do you know him as your Lord of righteousness? Can you say that the Lord Jesus Christ is Jehovah 
said Canu to you? Have you experienced his giving his righteousness to you? That's another way that we can put being saved. Listen, don't be like the nation of Judah who refused to receive correction from the Lord. I want to encourage you to turn from your sins. If you have never done this, I need you to turn, or he desires, he commands that you turn from your sins. That means repent. Say, I've had enough of these sins. I don't want to live that way any longer. I can't do it on my own. God, you're going to have to help me. Turn from your sins. Repent. Turn your back on those sins and acknowledge that Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is who you need to make you right with God. Listen, he lived a perfect life, gave his life as the perfect sacrifice, and now he offers you the gift of forgiveness and salvation. And the way you receive it is by repenting of your sins and placing your trust, your faith, in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That work involved him suffering for your sins. It involved him dying for your sins, being buried. But thankfully, after three days, Jesus rose again. His resurrection. Listen, he did that for you. He did that for you. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, desires to be your righteousness. And you can receive that by faith. Would you repent of your sins? Would you confess Jesus as Lord today? Would you acknowledge that there is no other name by which you can be saved? No one could do what only Jesus did. And that's to take your punishment. To be that perfect sacrifice acceptable to God. In order that you would be forgiven. And that you would have eternal life with him. So I want to encourage you to do that tonight. Cry out to God. Call to him. Pray. Those are all synonyms. Uh, It means talk to God. Tell him that you want to be saved, that you want to be forgiven of your sins because you recognize that if your sins are not dealt with, you will be under eternal punishment. And God does not desire that for you. So I want to encourage you tonight. Repent and place your faith in Jesus. And He will accomplish a good work in you. I thank you for joining us tonight. And I want to encourage you, if you are able, if you're in our area, we would love to have you join us for worship on Sundays. We are currently having one service on Sundays at 1045. Uh, We have our auditorium set up in uh, what we call our distancing format. Uh, We've got six feet between each of the rows, and uh, we would love for you to join with us for a time of worship as we praise the Lord together, as we pray, and uh, as we listen to the Word of God each week. I would encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, We're excited about what God is doing, what He's going to continue to do as we seek after Him. Uh, Let me pray for you as we close out our time. Father, thank you for your Word, and thank you for your faithfulness and your graciousness. God, you did not have to do any of these things. You didn't have to provide the way for us to be forgiven. But you did. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, Father for that promise that reveals your heart, to reveals, reveals the extent to which you went, that we might be made right with you. Father, I pray, would you seal your words into the hearts of the listeners this day. We give you praise with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless, and we'll see you next time.